I'm lucky enough to live in Oxford, one of the most beautiful cities in the south of England. But just occasionally, I long to head off somewhere new. Where this time? Ah, yes, Jordan. Perfect. It's a beautiful morning in southern Jordan, and Hanan and I are taking a gentle stroll around one of Al Baraka's date plantations with farm owner and leading date producer Nadine Naber. This is a lovely, lovely place, isn't it? It's so serene. Yes, it's, I think the nicest thing in the world is to walk in between the palm trees, especially in this farm. We're now in the Guera area of Jordan, uh -huh. uh, which is near Wadi Ram in the, in the southern part of Jordan. Mm -hmm. And this is one of our farms, uh, which has 14,000 palm trees. Oh. So that's <laughs> a lot of palm trees. <laughs> and a lot of dates. And a lot of dates, yes, yes. What varieties of dates do you have here? We have maybe 14, 15 date varieties, but we have four or five main varieties which we commercialize. Mm -hmm. We sell both dried and fresh. We harvest in both stages. Mm -hmm. If you're harvesting a date to be eaten fresh, yeah. you harvest at a different time to when you harvest a date that is going to be a dried date. Definitely. Fresh dates are in the beginning of the season when the bunches are green and they become yellow, yellow. the date pieces. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we cut the bunches and harvest them. While a dried date, we try to do as much as we can sun drying on the tree. Uh, so it's really as natural as, as possible. Mm. And so we have to wait at least one month until the date goes through all the different levels of maturity. Mm. So it's, yes, you're speaking about one, one to two months difference in harvesting. See, and I never knew that. It's, not, it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that we, you know, that I've eaten since I was tiny, and yet I never <laughs> had the faintest idea that there was a, there was a difference. Oh, yes, it's yeah. the, uh, in date palm farming, it's really a world within a world. There's yeah. so many, really, it's so many beautiful and interesting things to learn. How old are the trees here? These trees are around 15 years old. Once you plant it, it needs around seven years to give you a good commercial crop. Hmm. So you learn patience in, in farming. <laughs> And what's the lifespan, the, the useful lifespan? The useful lifespan, you can have a commercial fruit for 40 to 50 years. The first farm was started in the Jordan Valley by my father in 1989, and it was really uh, as a hobby. And after that, we started this plantation in 1993 we have now 12 farms in Jordan. Within five to six years, all our farms will be productive and we'll have a production of around 6,000 tons. Does your father still come down for the weekend to his palm trees? My father loves his palm trees. <laughs> they're, his, they're his children. Every single one is a child of his. Having been brought up with the business, Nadine has an ingrained knowledge of date cultivation. You have uh, male trees and female trees in, mm. in the date palm world. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> no, it's fascinating. Now we knew, yeah. Now yeah. <laughs> so. And how many male to female? Well, it's uh, for every 17 females, you need one, uh, uh, one male tree. Right. And so you take the pollen from the males, and then this is puffed into the female tree once it's pollination time. But by hand? We, we have special puffers. Uh -huh. Yes, so we have the powder, and uh, the pollen is in it, and we puff into the female sort of spate, part of the tree where the pollination occurs. Right. So you do that for every, for every, every bunch? Tree. It's a very manual process. It takes a lot of time, but this is to make sure that we get really the best uh, possible outcome. We have special ladders for the trees because the trunks are very slim. So one person who climbs up and cuts the bunch, two people at the bottom take the bunch mm -hmm. and hang it on these trunks. Ah, so not, not handbag hooks. Although I would love one for my Once they are strung up on these trolleys, the bunches of dates are trundled off to the pack house where they're manually checked for bruising or other defects and washed before packing. It's a long, long process, isn't it? It is. It, is. it takes uh, a lot of time, but it's, it's really a pleasure to see the final product mm. uh, in the pack, you know, ready, ready to sell in the market. Yeah. You have to so say goodbye to your babies. Uh, <laughs> bye bye to the babies until yeah. next year. Yeah. <laughs> until the cycle restarts the next year, yes. Now that we're completely up to scratch on date production, it's definitely time to find out how they taste and how Jordanians like to cook with them. Mm. 
Sophie, we are going to make fish and dibis. Actually, it's dates dibis, which is date molasses. I've got to say this, that just sounds really weird. <laughs> I know, I know, but really, they're very good to cook with. Yeah. What's the first thing we do? First thing with our we have fish? to do is to do the stuffing. Mm -hmm. This is fish from the Red Sea, it's Lovely. called Farida. So is it a kind of snapper? Yeah. To create our stuffing, Hanan and I chop some onions, squeeze a lemon and crush a generous amount of garlic. There we go. Lots okay. of lovely crushed Thank garlic. Uh, what this else? Dukka. This is a coriander mix. Uh -huh. And it has a little bit of everything in it. It's a sort of a, like a baharat, which is a mixed spice, okay. if you like. And a little bit of salt. Uh -huh. And then, of course, I can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> she never moves without a slug of olive oil. <laughs> Hanan mixes the filling lightly, then turns to the fish, which have suffered a little in the heat, but are still good enough to eat. You can either go ahead and start stuffing inside, or you can make some grooves in the fish. So basically, I'm scoring fish, so make sure, darn sure that the stuffing is well and truly absorbed. This simple stuffing is packed inside each fish, and then it's pushed into the gashes on each side. Next comes the key ingredient, dibis a seductively sweet and treacly date syrup. So it's sort of a sweet and sour fish. Yes. Jordanian style. Uh, modified to work in a farm. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, do you know, I think it's going to taste extra good out here. And after all, we've got beautiful palm trees, fresh air, and a little mountain behind us. OK, we're ready they to go. They look very smart, OK? We wrap the fish in a sturdy parcel of foil and lay it on the barbecue, although this dish is more commonly baked in the oven. Not many of those round yeah. here. Next, Hanan turns her hand to salad. So, basically, it's really quite simple, this salad. Just chop onions, garlic, cucumbers, tomatoes, and we just make tahini sauce. <laughs> OK. Tell me about tahini first. Tahini is the juice of sesame seeds. Mm-hmm. It's all paste, isn't it? Yeah. And that's what most people have when they eat hummus. Right, there's our salad vegetables, trimmed and diced. Now for the tahini. First, the juice of half a lemon. What happens next is a trifle disconcerting. Look at that, look at See how it solidifies? Yeah. But don't that worry about so that. Weird. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Yeah. That, now that it's, is getting really thick yeah, and tacky. No problem, keep and going. And that is so illogical that you add liquid and it gets thicker. <laughs> it is weird, isn't it? it? Is. OK, now we could have a little bit of water. You see, now it's beginning to turn back into liquid again. It's magic. There you go. Go straight in there. And if it does still, if you think it's too thick for you, then just add a bit, of, bit more water. So I've got to taste this, have I? Yes. Well, I know it's a, it's, it's a chore, but somebody has to do it. Yeah, you've got it there. Mmm! I like, I like very much. That is lovely. I love that rich, sort of shiny, the sesame taste of the, the tahini against yeah. fresh vegetables. Gosh, that's good. Fish gently roasting on the barbecue? Check. Salad ready? Check. Well, all in order. So it seems only polite to invite Nadine for lunch and to sample some of her dates. Before we go into the fish, because it's not quite ready yet, um, can you give us a tour of all these wonderful dates? <laughs> Definitely. We have many different varieties, among them Zihdi. Zihdi is a blonde date, as you can see, which has a really high fiber content and low sugar content. So mm. people who are on a diet or who are... Diabetic, maybe. Yes, I mean, it's a, maybe a healthier, let's say, option mm. or a low, low sugar option. Mm. This is Deglet Noor. Degla means finger and Noor means light. So it's the finger of light because supposedly when you put it up to the sun, you can <laughs> see the seed through the, through the date. Mm. And then we have uh, the Majul date, mm. which is also known as the king of dates because mm. it's this beautiful large piece with a lot of flesh and uh, caramel aftertones in the taste. And as if royalty weren't enough, the Al Baraka range also features divinely gilded fruit. Now for sweet lovers, we have mm. uh, two different things. The first one is stuffed dates. You can stuff dates with anything you want. You can, I mean, we have here uh, almonds, walnuts, and orange peel. When I was a child, my mum, I mean, this was a big treat at home, we used to have a little bit of cream cheese or feta cheese in a date, and it's lovely. Oh, that sounds delicious. Mm. I'm going to do that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and we also have chocolate-covered dates. How divine so, is that? Mm. Can I try one of your walnut oh, ones? Please do. That's good. 
That is very good. It is really nice. Oh, what an amazing treat. After that sweet starter, we turn to things savoury. The fish is done and ready to serve. Oh, that looks good, doesn't it? Mm, doesn't that look delicious. good? So should we serve it up nicely on a dish, on plates, or shall we just go for it, girls? Let's dig in. <laughs> OK. Oh, that looks lovely. That's the nice. smell is superb. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's lovely. I'm definitely going to make another mm -hmm. date with a fish. <laughs> definitely. That is really nice. And you get that little hint of sweetness on the outside, but it's not overwhelming. It's just okay. a really nice touch. A touch. And then you get all the lemony flavours. And the onion. God, that is such a good way of cooking fish. A good. new one to add to my repertoire. I hope you don't mind me stealing your recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Full permission. And thank you very much, Nadine, for having us for letting us uh, come and cook on your date farm. Always a first. And uh, just for producing the best dates in the world. Thank you for coming. Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you. It's been a happy morning strolling through the palm trees, but now Hanan and I head further south to the town of Marne. In many ways, Marne is an unremarkable little place, though it has played an interesting role in history. So this is Marne Castle. Uh, yes, it's more of a fort, really, rather than a castle. Um, it was built by the Ottoman Empire. Oh, hold on. Tell me about the Ottomans, because I'm okay. not sure who they were. Um, the Ottomans, in Arabic, they're called Osmani. Um, they were based in Turkey. They ruled the Arab world for 400 years. And this fort was uh, built to protect the people who are going to the Hajj from oh, the Hajj. Stop you again. Oh. Explain the Hajj to Sorry. me. Sorry. The Hajj is a, a requirement, really, by um, all Muslims to visit Mecca at least once in their lives. Uh, have you done it? No, maybe when I get a little <laughs> bit older. <laughs> <laughs> so this would have been on the route from where to where? From Damascus to Mecca, which is in Saudi. So, tell me, why did they need a fort like this? Well, the pilgrims would have uh, quite a fair bit of money on board, um, so they're easy targets for bandits. Ah, right, so they really were uh, they they needed needed protection. A protection, yes. And um, tell me a bit more about this building. Well, um, I think it was originally built as a fort, but gradually um, they they changed it so in the late the, up until very recently they turned it into a prison but now it's um, it's occupied by the Ministry of Antiquities so you're free to wander anywhere you like. The fortress was used as a prison right up to the late 1980s and retains an oppressive atmosphere and there's one particularly stark reminder of its past. What about that there? A um, platform. Apparently, up until 1980s, they used to shoot people. Oh, that is so grim. Yes. I was thinking more, you know, performances, and, um, uh, but yes. not of that kind. Escaping the fort's courtyard, Hanan and I head out of town and happen upon this immaculately preserved steam train, a relic of the Hejaz Railway. The narrow gauge railway was built especially for Hajj pilgrims travelling from Damascus to Mecca in the Hejaz region of Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, work on the railroad was halted by the outbreak of World War I, so the track finishes 250 miles short of its destination. Luckily, Hanan and I are not travelling by train to our final destination. An early glimpse of the majesty to come is the towering might of the Seven Pillars of Wisdom, named after T.E. Lawrence's memoirs. It's our first intimation of the magnitude and beauty of Wadi Rum itself. Instead of traditional but slow and stately camel transport, Hanan and I settle into something a tad more up-to-date, though no less bumpy. Didn't T. Lawrence describe this as vast, echoing and godlike? Absolutely right. It's a good description. Yeah. One of Jordan's most breathtaking sights, Wadi Rum sees a steady stream of visitors every year, drawn into its seemingly never-ending desert landscapes. Our Bedouin guide, Salim Ali, was born and raised in Wadi Rum and knows every centimetre of the terrain. What a playground. I can't imagine what it must have been like growing up here and having this. 
Yes, sometimes uh, you feel the same, but you, the beauty you see at uh, sunset time <sighs> and the weather is changing. Mm. And it must be very hot in the summer. So. Yeah, they, it can be uh, like 45 degrees. I think. Oh, and there's not much shade out here. You have to find the yeah. mountain, big shade. <laughs> oh, no, there's a tree over there. That's not a lot, is it? <laughs> what is a, a wadi? Wadi, it's in uh, word in Arabic, which means a valley. It's a big valley here, this Wadi Ram Valley. It, it certainly is a big valley. I mean, this is, this is about as big as valleys yeah. get, isn't it? Yeah. So was it formed by, by a river running through it? Yes, it's a uh, wadi, they call it where it's always the water from the rain float, take one direction. So this valley was all the rain come from the mountain and make a big river and take the wadi of Wadi Ram. And how long is the wadi? Uh, wadi Ram, there is a protected area which uh, 60 square, <laughs> the national park Wadi Ram. But uh, the whole Wadi Ram like 370 square. Wadi Rum's most famous 20th century visitor was, of course, the British Army officer Thomas Edward Lawrence, who became known as Lawrence of Arabia as a result of his involvement with the Arab revolt against Ottoman rule. One of the reasons I think a lot of people know Wadi Rum is from the very famous film about Lawrence of Arabia, yeah. which was shot around here somewhere? Yes, Lawrence of Arabia was shot in this valley of Wadi Rum, <laughs> in front of there. And but Lawrence of Arabia, I mean, he really did come here. Not all the events that happened in the film happened here, uh, but he did spend time yeah, here. Yeah, they spent time here and they spent time in the east of Wadi Ram, and then they crossed to Egypt after uh, Aqaba, when they went to, to Aqaba. Driving deeper into the Wadi, further and further from the modern world, Salim takes us to see a remarkable rock formation, where we meet his brother Salim. The Hizam of Rose Bridge, one from the most beautiful place in Wadi Ram. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's famous uh, in Wadi Ram. There is like two, three bridges in Wadi Ram. This is one from the biggest bridge in Wadi Ram. So uh, a lot of visitors come here to climb up and to enjoy. Yes, because it's not, it's not a bridge that anybody's made, is it? No, not no, a human being anyway. No, no, this is a na uh, natural bridge and since when we were young, it's very beautiful, very, very beautiful. Are you going up? Going up, I think, is, is not the problem. It's actually coming down is the problem. We jump when we <laughs> Oh, you've got parachutes. Yes. <laughs> With the light going down and the temperature dropping, Salem whisks us off to his campsite, a cool collection of tents shaded by sandstone mountains with a view to die for. Here, Hanan and I are going to get a taste of Bedouin hospitality in the form of a traditional desert meal. This is called zarb. Um, sometimes you see a, a properly constructed pit made of brick, and sometimes you people just find any old um, barrel and they just make the, the adopt adopt it. What kind of wood is it? They collect it from the desert. So just old old trees and yeah. scrub. Yeah. So zarb is really this method of cooking. In the ground? In the ground, yes. So basically, they have these special trays which they place inside these drums. So you wait until the fire is completely died down and you put whatever you like. These are the vegetables. He's got uh, potatoes and he's got uh, gorgettes here. Yeah. But that's not all there is to it. Our chef is hard at work. Kitchen, just in case you didn't realize. It may be basic. But our supper is taking shape nicely. So this is the big spice to put it to the chicken to prepare it for the zarb. Like uh, pepper and uh, cardamom and salt and um, like lemon salt. And uh, special mix of Amir. This is Amir, this is the cook. Hi, Amir. Yes. <laughs> uh, can I taste a bit? Yes. Mm. You can. Mm. It, mm. Mm. Very nice. lemony. Mm. Mm. Always the cook, he tried to do the best <laughs> to get the taste of her food. And with that, our chef Amir sets about seasoning the chicken. So you just simply sprinkle that on and then it's ready? Yes. It takes longer to cook the meat, which is why it's down below. Ah, that's clever, isn't yes. it? So that gets the main bit of the heat and this just gently, yes. gently cooks, stews yes. or sweats. Sweetly inside its foil. Now that the meat has been evenly laid out on the lower rack, 
Amir carefully lowers the tray into the drum over the hot coals. Wow. So it's really tight on those coals and those glowing embers. Yes. Amir and Salem cover the top with a double layer of baking foil to keep out the sand and then seal it with a sturdy metal lid. Now the insulation, a camel hair blanket and then a thick layer of sand. The zerb will be left to cook for one and a half hours. They really do take it seriously, this covering up. Yeah. Okay? Okay. It's okay. I don't think it's going to escape. <laughs> Daylight swiftly ebbs, the darkness drowning out the high cliffs of Wadi Rum. As hunger sets in, we join the crowd, eagerly waiting for the uncovering of the zerb. Off comes sand, blanket, metal cover and foil releasing the scent of slow-cooked lemony chicken. The reveal as the grill emerges from the ground is a moment of pure drama. Amir takes his bow as the audience applauds. Yay! trip. As the men organize the food, we all head for the master tent where Salem and friends take up their instruments to belt out a little Bedouin music to keep our appetites at bay. And we're not the only ones enjoying ourselves. Ah, the Zerb is on the table. Time to pitch in. Yes! yes. Oh, time! Watched over by Chef Amir, we all help ourselves to rice, chicken, vegetables and salad. We love that chicken. Nice. Spread. There we go. In the shadowy tent, warmed by the richly woven Bedouin rugs, the atmosphere is convivial and laid back. The desert songs keep night chills out of mind as we settle down to our plates of zerb. Mm, that chicken is very nice. Mm. Very tender, very moist. Um, I was slightly surprised because it was just you know, very bare and that heat just hitting it like that. Mm. Um, I thought it might be a bit dry, but that's lovely. 21st century Bedouin life is changing faster than ever before. But despite curious tourists like us and the murmur of generators amongst the rocks, some values remain constant. There's no doubting Salim and Salem's powerful connection to the desert sands of Wadi Rum and the pride and joy they take in its sheer magnificence.